RTFR. My faith in destiny is all I need to prevail. Truth Frequency Radio. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to be. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. You're listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project with your host, Rob Skiba. All I'm offering is the truth. Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And tonight I have two very special guests that are going to be joining me shortly. Uh, They should be certainly very popular amongst those of you who are looking into the whole issue of the flat earth. One of them, of course, is Mark Sargent, who... Uh, put out the Flat Earth Clues videos that got many of us started in looking into this subject. And the other is Patricia Steer, who has uh, a whole lot of YouTube videos and interviews that she's done on Flat Earth and other hot potatoes. And I saw something on Facebook that Patricia wrote, I think it was yesterday, it said, let's unite. That means no hate and no name calling, mutual respect and promoting each other with pats on the back and high fives. I'm in. Are you? I said, I'm in. And so to prove it, I'm going to go ahead and let's get started. Uh, Patricia, are you there? Yes, I certainly am, Rob. Thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. Mark, are you there? I am, and I'm full of flat earth friendship. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Well, uh, we've, we've been on each other's – well, actually, Patricia has never been on my show before, I don't believe. I've been on her show. Uh, of course, Mark, you've been on mine. I've been on yours. Uh, yep. But, uh, both of you have done a lot of very interesting – interviews in the last few months and um i haven't had time to watch or listen to all of them but i'm very intrigued by the subject matter so i figured well maybe i'll just get you guys on my show and get the cliff notes (laughs) (laughs) uh so uh tell you what mark why don't we start with you uh you have your show also here on truth frequency and um i know you've you've done some really cool interviews i've listened to the the missile uh instructor guy in fact i had him on my show uh, and the surveyor and a few others, but um, why don't you just give us kind of a rundown of the most, what, what would you say are the most interesting interviews, most compelling that you've had so far on this sure. subject? Sure. The, uh, the, the show that, that I do on this network on Truth Frequency is called Strange World, and I, we were doing it for a while. We were just kind of covering flatter stuff, kind of going over backstories, and then a couple months ago, uh, I started getting solicited by people, professionals out in the field. And I, I kind of had a feeling it was going to happen anyway because on Clue 10, I was kind of calling out for the whistleblowers and saying, look, if anyone knows anything that can help prove this, you know, that we're not on a globe, that it is more, you know, definitely more flat than it is a globe, please come forward. Now, I wasn't expecting, you know, NASA employees or radio telescope operators or astrophysicists or anything like that. But the people that came forward did kind of surprise me. Uh, and the first guy that came forward, and, and you did a show on it, I don't think you've aired it yet, right? What's that? Uh, Ra, uh, the uh, Sean McCrary. Yeah, that was uh, the week before last, I believe. I did. Oh, okay, okay. I just haven't the- uploaded to YouTube yet. Oh, perfect. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I should probably download from this network and, and listen to it. <laughs> the um, uh, Sean McCrary contacted me and said, you know, he's he was a Navy uh, Sparrow missile instructor for the United States Navy. And he says, yeah, he goes, I'd really like to talk about this because there's multiple points I, I can go over that basically show that it's not a globe. And I was going, wow, that's really interesting. And we gave him every opportunity to be anonymous. You know, that's we were, I was kind of encouraging that, especially since, you know, he'd been in the Navy 10 years and. 
uh, was was wanted to go career, and we we said, look, uh, do you do you want to? And and all the way up until the interview, we said, look, you you know you don't have to do it. We'll do it anonymous. Jonathan was really adamant about that. He's like, look, we can't burn this guy down. You know, maybe he just doesn't know what he's getting into. And just before the interview goes, he goes, you know what? Let's just use we're, let's use my whole name. And so he comes on. And we go into – and you know, I'm just going to give you the, the Reader's Digest version. You already know most of it. But we get into how he broke it down. Not only did he not see any curve with any instruments he used, he also didn't use – didn't see anything regarding the Coriolis effect. For those people who don't know out there, that's the spin of the earth, which has been used in mainstream media uh, to account for some uh, projectiles being shot, most notably snipers. And that the navigation was all wrong in the southern hemisphere. I mean, he just, you know, one, two, three, and and he hit these points, and they were very, very well done, in my opinion. He knew, and he was about as credible as they as they come. He uh, not only, you know, the first thing, and I think I heard you talking about it on the uh, on the John B. Wells uh, show just recently, which was, you know, he was shooting a, a two inch beam radar. At, he's painting targets at fifty nautical miles, which is push, pushing sixty. Um, land miles and it shouldn't happen it should not be able to happen and he's saying look it's and and i know that i i was remembering it's fresh in my head because i listened to it you know john was saying well you know it's not consistent it's going the hell it isn't consistent you know that they wouldn't even use it if it wasn't consistent they're painting the target and there's they have to paint the target for that missile system uh the missile isn't a um a fine drone target it has to rely on the radar hitting you know the radar hitting it so it can follow where the radar's uh tagging it on the ship and I thought that was brilliant uh, where, where he went to that. And then um, he also said that the Coriolis effect isn't used for any of these firing solutions. So when they're firing missiles out at 60 miles, the Coriolis effect isn't taken into account in, in, in anything. And that completely contradicts uh, mainstream media when they say that, that snipers have to do it at, uh, at, at as little as one mile. It's like, okay, so the snipers have to do it one mile, but the – a missile instructor doesn't have to do it at sixty. It didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, then he goes into navigation in the southern hemisphere, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to give away too much because you know you, you've already done the show. But it was incredible the amount of stuff. And then on top of it, it, you know, he he made himself so for anyone that was in doubt. Almost immediately after the interview, he comes on. Or he gives me videos, and I don't know if you watched them, where it, you know, if anyone questioned who he was, people are going, no, he's not a real Navy guy. He has a real-time video going from the helicopter to the Iwo Jima, where he was stationed, uh, where, you know, showing him the ship, the helicopter, him, the ship, the helicopter. It was like 12 minutes long or something like that. And then just for, for grins, and I didn't even think he, you know, I thought he was going to get in trouble for this, he shoots a one-minute video inside the Navy training facility for the Mar- the the Sea Sparrow missile system, and just to drive the point home, you know, he, he doesn't say a word. He he shows the the missile system, the people standing around it, and then he focuses down on a cocktail napkin. He takes a wax marker or whatever, and he writes "Flat Earth Mark Sergeant." <laughs> turns the napkin over, focuses on himself, so people know it's him, and it was brilliant. I I, I the the guy was wonderful, and it's like, look, th- that was fantastic. So. Um, the other guys, you want me to keep going? Well, why don't we just go ahead and, uh, we'll, we'll go, we'll ping pong back and forth. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, uh Patricia, you've had, uh, quite, it seems like you've interviewed like everybody in like the last two months or so. Um, who would you say was the most interesting so far? Oh, that's really hard. Well, I probably should say Rob Skiba, oh. but <laughs> oh, you suck or, or I should say suck I should up. say Mark oh. Sargent, probably. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's not going to help you. <laughs> no, no, no. Wow. But uh, there's been so many. There's really nobody who's the most interesting. But when it comes to things that involve those who are not familiar with flat Earth and want actual mathematical proof. I had a structural engineer on. He's licensed and he's practicing and his name is Brian Mullen. And it was on episode number 15 of Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. And that's my YouTube channel. So if you want to watch the whole thing, um, episode number 15 is the one you'd look for on my channel. And um, he has his own channel called Balls Out Physics. He's a really great guy, a young guy. And uh, what he's done is, well, what he's trying to do to show people is looking at how the equation for gravity was developed and the experiment that was allegedly used to determine 
the gravitational constant. People call it the big G. Um, the original experiment's really hard for anybody to try to replicate. It was done over 200 years ago, and that's how we have gravity today. And um, the Cavendish experiment uh, supposedly was successfully performed, and there's been no actual video evidence of the Cavendish experiment. It's a torsion balance, and people have talked about it as hanging balls in a shed. So uh, this is what he talks about, Brian Mullen, the, uh, the structural engineer, and pretty much can't find how the mass of the Earth can be calculated by setting the gravity equation equal to the weight equation. So it all is real complicated, but there are many people who will only look at flat Earth if they can have math put in front of their faces. And Brian Mullen uh, from the Balls Out Physics channel on one of my uh, shows, episode number 15, will definitely help anybody who needs numbers. You know, it's funny, though. I mean, because I, I hear that a lot, too. They want, everybody wants the math, the math, the math, math. But then when you show them the equation that illustrates the curvature, they don't want to look at the math. Well, you know, we can see Chicago, but that's impossible according to the math, so it must be a mirage. You know, it's gravity! It's the, I, I, I finally I was starting to lose it uh, a, a week or two ago. I was just posting, like, gravity was the answer, and I would say, gravity! It's like Tony the Tiger, you know? It's gravity! For, like, the answer for everything is gravity, but from what I've seen so far, nobody really knows what, they know what gravity does, but nobody knows what it is. And yet it's the answer for everything. Yeah. Well, Mark, you were saying something about gravity recently, and I think it had something to do with, well, Jaren also mentioned it of the Jaronism channel, about how you could go on Wikipedia and read the definition for gravity and then just replace it with the word God, because gravity has all of these mysterious powers like God. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a catch-all. Gra- yeah, yeah. Gravity is an interesting, you know, even mainstream science, and anyone can go up uh, and look this up, mainstream science has a really hard time defining gravity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, some people say, well, it's mass and it's and it's this and it's that. And, you know, they have to, you know, because uh, all the books talk about it being a sphere, they have to talk about, you know, density and, and the, the, the core of the earth, which we still don't know anything about, uh, is the density of it is pulling everything into it. And that's and that's gravity. That's fine and dandy and all, but we have no practical application of this outside of earth, unless you believe the moon stuff. And that's a whole nother thing. I don't want to get into it right the second. But what I what I have tried to talk about it from a from a gaming standpoint where where I came from I said look when we build simulations when we build anything that's in the gaming world or not even the gaming world any any sort of simulation in a computer you have to build in physics nowadays you have to build in gravity well what is gravity and the things that we build from a programming standpoint and they said well what is it and I go well it's really just an equation more than anything else all you really tell the the simulation to do is treat everything uh, you know what i what i try to tell people now is treat everything like it's being pulled down by a, like a molecular magnet and that sounds too simple but what i mean is so if a normal magnet attracts metal we all know all know what that does you know it attracts steel well if you had the ability to have, to create a magnet that could pull anything be it uh, metal or organic or whatever and you put that underneath you what's the difference between that and what science is describing is gravity because that's what we use in the in the simulation world. We just say, okay, the g- gravity is going to be this heavy. It's going to pull everything down this much and we can we can flip the dial to anything we want on it. And uh you know, that's just how it's built. So I I that's what I treat it for everything now. Uh gravity is not an answer for anybody that comes at you with anything because it's assumed the the gravity that they're talking about is assuming a physical sphere that's flying through space and I just don't I I haven't bought it now for months and months and I'm I'm never going to buy it. Well, it's not just a sphere though. It, it, as, at least as I understand it, the current gravity model requires a spinning sphere. <laughs> Well, yes, that and that poses it's, it's it's an entirely new set of problems. One which I'd love to bring up real quick, which is, uh, yeah, yeah. Gr- there's gravity, and then there's centrifugal force, and th- I love throwing this at people because the, you know the scientists get will, will get angry, which is okay. So gravity spins, right? But then you've got centrifugal force, which tries to throw you. You know, throw you off at the same time. And we've got a lot of water on this planet. So how is the water completely uniform 
all over the place. And they said, well, it's gravity. I was going, yeah, but it's, <laughs> but it's, but it's not just gravity anymore. It's gravity and centrifugal force. So at the very least, you would think that, gra- that centrifugal force would start pulling the oceans down from the north and south poles and sort of congealing it towards in the center, kind of like a big spare tire, like Saturn's rings only made out of water. And, you know, they're like, no, 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 gravity's much stronger than that. It's keeping everything uniform. I was going, man, that, that's pretty thin. That's what uh, was frustrating me with the whole – because it's not just centri- centrifugal force, which yeah. is something that is testable, observable. Um, it's zetetic. It's something that you can actually – you can ask the questions about and do a test and check it out. Get on a – you know, get on the rotor or whatever and get, you know, stuck to the wall as the guy next to you is puking all over you at the Six Flags. Yeah, there you go. You know, we know that this works. You, you can get – you know, on a merry-go-round and get it going fast enough, you're going to fly off. But it's not just centrifugal force. It's also angular momentum. That you're dealing with. So not only does something spinning want to throw you off, but it also wants to throw you off at the angle that it's spinning. Yeah. And so you've got two different, you know, related forces wanting to send you off in an easterly direction, and yet none of us are leaning to the right. <laughs> As we're, yeah. You know, if we're facing north, you know, none of us are leaning to the right, and gravity somehow pulling us left, so that we end up straight up and down. I'm thinking everything way differently than I used to. Um, my, I sit in front of my stupid computer for way too long 15 hours a day sometimes yeah so and it's taking a toll on my back and the only thing other than chiropractic adjustment adjustment that's helping me is getting up and walking so i've determined okay i'm going to walk two to three miles a day and and the more i do it the better it, it is on my back but as i'm walking you know i'm looking around at nature and stuff and, and i'm sitting there now wait a minute okay if this gravity thing is so i'm 175 pounds it's holding me down just fine Mm-hmm. How come that branch over there that's leaning over doesn't get pulled down to the ground? Yeah, I, I don't get it. I don't. Yeah. You know, how do birds fly? Yeah. Uh, you know, the oceans are fine and they're they're sticking to the ball Earth that's spinning, but birds are able to break free and they weigh you know nothing. Yeah, bugs. How does a bug overcome the the force of gravity that's holding a hundred and seventy five pound man down? Yeah, I don't get. Yeah, it. yeah, that's, they're, they're excellent points, and 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 yet that same gravity they'll use the excuse for holding the atmosphere down. You know, it's like it's like so the vacuum of space is is got an amazing pull to it, but it can't rip the atmosphere off because gravity's holding it down. And I'm thinking, okay, if that's the case, shouldn't be there? Shouldn't be there like this water tension line only with the atmosphere, to where you get up to a certain point and you kind of like pop out. Where, you know, it's like atmosphere, atmosphere, vacuum. Because if there was this constant bleeding, I would have thought it would have bled it off a long time ago. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, and where's the shear? If the atmosphere is attached, I don't know how the atmosphere is attached to the Earth, but if it is spinning with the Earth a thousand miles an hour, yeah. whenever a spaceship punches out of that, how come it doesn't, you know, get zinged by the, <laughs> yeah. the, the final barrier of the thousand mile an hour you know, well, this, yeah. uh, it, it's it's gradual. It's not a hard line. Well, like you said, though, it's if there's the vacuum of space, yeah. h- how are these two things working? Yeah, the first in- time that we ever shot a rocket into space, I don't believe we did. But the first time we ever went into the blackness of space, that hole punched through should have killed everybody on the planet. <laughs> I like we wouldn't it. be here talking now. I like it. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, like the space shuttle, uh, I even saw a video where uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about the reality of space. And he's like, we really shouldn't say that we are going into space, you know, with the International Space Station or the um, shuttlecraft. Because, and he had a globe and he was showing about how far 400 miles, that's about as far as they've gone, yeah. uh, is in relation to the ball. And so he's got a fairly decent sized globe and he's like, maybe a, uh, a quarter of an inch or eighth of an inch off of the ball. Yeah. He's like, this is how far they're going. So how can you really say this is space? You know? And, and I would talk to John uh, from perceptions radio uh, mm-hmm. just before I, I brought you guys on uh-huh. and he was saying, you know, I got a, I got a theory. I want to maybe throw out there for you guys to talk about. And he was saying, do you think maybe the reason why Neil deGrasse Tyson is really pushing this, you know, they went from it's spherical to it's an oblate spheroid, to now it's pear-shaped, yeah. and pear-shaped with the bulge being south of the equator, yep. to, to account for the difference in the longitudinal lines uh, south of the equator. To say, well, see, the reason why the difference between the longitudinal lines north of the equator is X, um, and the reason why it's Y is because it's actually wider 
you know, at the pear shape. And he's, yeah. he's trying to say, well, maybe that's their way of trying to seed this out into the public so people don't ask any questions. Because on the azimuthal equidistant map, naturally the longitudinal lines are fanning out. Yeah, yeah, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the moves that they make, and by that I mean you know the authority, the people that you know we're going up against here, they make some really clever moves, and that's one of them. And and he made that quite a while ago, and he was absolutely right because we had a caller that called in on Strange World. I think it was like it wasn't last week or maybe the week before, and he came. You know, again, the, the internet hive mind is just brilliant, and he says, "Yeah, you don't have to go to the equator to. to I'm sorry, you don't have to go to Antarctica to, to prove the coastline to to figure out the the." Um, the distances are, are wrong. He goes, just go t- make a, take a plane 10 degrees above and 10 degrees below the equator, have them do circles mm-hmm. and they should be identical, right? Because on a globe, those, those distances are identical. But he said, but in, in the AE map, it's got this one in the South is going to be much longer. And he goes, he goes, there you go. You don't even have to go near the Antarctic defense force. And then, yeah, Jonathan threw this out there and he's going, he's going, yeah, but if, if they're saying it's pear shaped already, then that's all they'll say. You can do the test. They'll come back and they say, well, it's because it's pear shaped because Neil deGrasse Tyson went on that uh, collegiate thing and said that. Uh, and it's brilliant. Yeah, it was a good move. That's exactly but why they did it. But it, it throws out the fact that the first and only, until recently, picture of Earth from space, the Apollo picture, was a perfect circle. So it ding, just shows ding, they're ding. lying right there. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and you, yeah. And you're right. The, the, every shot we've t- we've seen, including you know the entire three dimensional model of Google Earth, is a perfect down to the pixel sphere. And so, yeah, so even when Neil Dress, they contradict themselves quite a few, and I'm going to call them out every chance I get. And that's, you're absolutely right, Patricia, uh, where every picture we see is a perfect sphere. So if it's a perfect sphere, what's Neil deGrasse say, saying that it's an oblate spheroid? And then he's saying it's pear-shaped. And then people say, well, it's imperceptible if that's the case. It's it's not actually, you can't perceive it with the naked eye. I'm going, well, he probably, it, Neil deGrasse doesn't miss details like that. He would have come and put the disclaimer out in front and said, oh yeah, I know I said it's oblate spheroid. I know I said it's pear-shaped, but you'd never be able to tell with a camera. It's like, really? Then why'd you say it? Well, why, why, why'd you even bother? I, I, somebody had, because I was debating with somebody about this online, and, and they were saying, well, what he's really referring to is the solid portion of the Earth. You, you might have seen the model out there that shows the Earth without the water on it. Yeah. And, and the, just the rock part of the Earth kind of looks like a pear. Do you think maybe that that's what he was saying or that's eh, – Maybe, but the oceans for the most part aren't that deep. You know, when you, when you said that it's – you know, when he was holding up 400 miles, it was barely even – you know, you could barely even see what he was doing there. The oceans are even worse than that because even the deepest part of the oceans are the, – they're not even uh, – what's the Marianas Trench? 25,000 feet max? That's what, five miles? That's nothing. Mm-hmm. That's, that's barely even a coat of paint, uh, you know, on, on that thing. So no, no. He, he screwed up. Uh, either deliberately and, you know, in hopes to buy them time or, you know, he was just being too clever for his own good. And maybe he was giving something away there where he was kind of prepping people for, well, you know, the model isn't what we think it is because, yeah, the the only shot we had for 43 years was the Apollo 17 shot, which is a perfect sphere. And don't, by the way, don't think for an accident, I don't know if I, I ever talked to you about this, Rob, don't think for an accident that that picture only showed one continent in its entirety, which was Antarctica. It's two two birds with one stone. It was brilliant they, when they thought so it was like they planned this for years and years and years, decades. Yeah, yeah. You had to have a backup plan for this, and I've I've said this all along. Where you couldn't, you you were never going to be able to hide this thing forever. I think I joked with you, Patricia, that it was like hiding something from your roommates because we all live here. You can't hide something that you're living on forever. And so you have to come up with, with, with as many cover stories and as many layers as you can, even to the point – I'll only take it one step further – to the Bart Sebrel thing the, uh, from the Earth to the Moon where, you know, where they shot – they were simulating the Earth through that, that round window. I think even that was another layer because at least that makes you think that they're in orbit faking a picture of the Earth from uh, 200,000 miles out. That fooled me when I first saw that because I hadn't figured out the Earth was flat yet. Then it wasn't until later I discovered your videos, uh, Flat Earth Clues, Mark. Yeah. I saw that and I was thinking, okay, well, they're in a spaceship and they're faking the picture of Earth. I, it didn't yeah. dawn on me till later, like, oh, wait a minute. They're just in a really high plane, like a spy plane or something. Yeah, yeah. Or where, yeah, wherever they were, if they were doing parabolic flight, faking – yeah, faking it. It was brilliant. That was clever because I was wondering, it's like, who leaked that tape to that British guy anyway? 
Because it's like, why would you leak it to him out of all the people? You're going to leak it to a conspiracy guy, this particular conspiracy guy, and he's going to run with it? It was, it was very clever. I will give him points for that one. But, and I bought it too. I was going, oh, wow, they're faking the, the pictures of, of the moon. But again, it didn't, I didn't click in me with, with me why. And it, because I, it always bugged me for the longest time, years, where it's like, why would they fake the space program? It's like, no, they didn't want to fake it. They had to fake it. If you don't fake it, you're going to run into where what we're running into now, but it's going to be much, much earlier. Rob, here's a question. Um, it's a biblical question, and you'll be able to answer it way more than I have. I've heard somebody say that uh, when, okay, Neil deGrasse Tyson, when he said the Earth is an uh, oblate sp- spheroid or pear shaped he means the land mass, and you two were just talking about if you remove the water. In the Bible, is the Earth the land without the water? Technically. Yeah. Well, yeah, technically, the, the word that's translated as earth is in Hebrew is aretz, which, which means the, the physical land mass. But, I mean, that's, you know, technically speaking, that's what the, the word means. However, it does appear to be used in reference to this, this whole thing that we're standing on, you know, uh, that we would later, you know, eventually call the planet. Uh, you know, the world, let's say, in general. Right. But, uh, so he, he but, probably wasn't uh, u- using any sort of earth biblical. He won't ever go back. That it, Well, I meant the one in the Bible, uh, because well, he himself is probably an atheist, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. We're about ready to go to break right now, so we'll come back and, and deal with that a little bit more when, when we come back. I, because I don't think that he was, because he's hardcore atheist and, and has nothing good to say about God or the Bible. So, you know, I wouldn't see him be the guy to be endorsing the the Hebraic word uh, for the world. But anyway, uh, it says we're going to break. I don't hear the music, so there it goes. Freaky Friday with the Woe Crew. Friday. Truth Frequency Radio. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and tonight I'm talking with my guests, Mark Sargent from Strange World and Patricia Steer from Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. And right before the break, we were talking about Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, what the biblical word for Earth is and how it relates really specifically to the land. Um, Speaking of the land, we know that the Earth has uh, ley lines, on it, and a lot of my prior research involved uh, looking into the megalithic structures around the world. And of course, anybody who looks into that realizes a lot of these things are on these ley lines, these energy field lines. Uh, have either of you guys seen the graphic that uh, one of my friends on Facebook put out? Uh, she had taken the ley lines as depicted, I think it was as depicted on the Mercator map, and basically wrapped it around and, and redid it to fit on the azimuthal equidistant map. And when she did, the pattern that the ley lines formed was the, uh, the symbol for the seed of life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The flower of life. Yeah. I, I, you know, I have a question about that. I've often wondered about things like the pyramids and the Sphinx. And I know, Mark, you, you've been to Egypt mm-hmm. and how those things are all connected. But on the flat map, uh, how it all works out. And that's what this drawing you're talking about is? I haven't seen it. Yeah, there, if you're, we're friends on Facebook, so if you go to, into my notes section, I actually did a YouTube video on this too. Uh, the note was called Just a Coincidence? question mark, And I was showing all the various international organizations, of course the United Nations being the first one, but all the other, you know, the, the international aviation, you know, the meteorological, uh, uh, nautical, all these various organizations have some variant uh, of the equidistant map, the azimuthal equidistant map. Um, 
but the the uh, have you seen the flag the new flag of the earth that NASA's trying to put out it's like here's yes. the flag and it has the same basic blue color as the UN flag but it has the seat of life on it yeah is their logo and uh so it's like wait a minute here's the here's what they're putting out is this is the new flag for the whole earth yet it has a seat of life on it and if you take the ley lines of the earth it just so and you lay it out it just so happens to form the <laughs> the seat of life on the flat earth map yeah, and uh, yeah, that's just a little bit more than a coincidence, if you ask me. Agreed. Yeah, totally agree. Hey, but by the way, let me—if if you don't mind—I'd like to chime in real quick on that Neil deGrasse Tyson thing because I know he's—he's he's not a religious man, really. Uh, we, and that is, you know, his not necessarily his direct mentor, but I, I still like bringing it up to people because it makes them scratch their head, and that's Werner von Braun's headstone. Mm-hmm. You know, where, where he, you know, you'd think the father of rocket science, you know, the, literally the guy that you would, you know, when you say rocket scientist, that's the guy who, who founded NASA has, you know, it's a very modest headstone. It has his name, date, you know, the, the year he was born, the year he died, and a single Bible uh, verse, which is Psalms 19.1, which talks about in the King's James thing, uh, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Why, why would a rocket scientist mention in passing a dome-like structure which is you know part of an archaic belief from thousands of years ago why why would he leave that breadcrumb and i i people say oh well you know is quince like why is he bringing it up at all why does he have a bible verse on his headstone he's a you know he's about as hardcore scientist as they come i don't remember him quoting you know a lot of philosophy like einstein did so yeah. just something i throw out there yeah uh, i don't know if you had a chance to watch the uh the the new edit of the show that uh, the last show I did on yours uh, what was it back in September? Oh yeah yeah yeah. And you actually put the yeah, that's part of the reason you put that you put the slide in there. Yeah, well I put the clips from uh, well I put the slide in there of his gravestone, but also the clips from uh, Ascension with the other Nazi guy, and he's talking about the firmament and everything and and yeah. all that. Um, but I don't know if you saw later in the video. What caught my attention about – I kept saying it was the 2012 blue marble, but I was wrong. It was the 2002 blue marble, yeah. but how it had that backward C cloud formation that had a like long tail on it. And I kept yep. seeing it over and over and over again. And, and since then, it's like almost everywhere I see an animated earth, it's always that same one right there, which just proves that we're dealing with 3D models, yeah. not actual pictures of the earth. Yeah, and were, wasn't it you the one that 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 noticed all the uh, on one of those older models all the Photoshop laziness? Yeah, I wasn't the first one. Uh, but, somebody but, else had cued me in on it, but then I did uh, a pretty thorough analysis of it and start. Yeah. You know, look at the clone tool. Look at the clone tool. I mean, you got to fire that Photoshop. Yeah, that yeah, that was just lazy. Oh, because yeah, you see it all the time in in daily nine to five people. They use the clone tool. It's like, oh, I'll just fill this in, copy this cloud, paste, paste, paste. And it's like, really, you're gonna do it on that model? Really? <laughs> One of the most I wonder if they people ever get fired. You know these people that are putting out this really bad CGI and really bad Photoshop. I wonder after the internet, as you say, hive mind mark, tears it apart, if somebody gets fired. Oh, I think somebody got fired after uh, Rob found that square around the moon photo from the Apollo missions. The moon yeah, because they above, changed it. Above the flag. Yeah, I think somebody was fired there. Well, and, and heck, Matt was fired. <laughs> Officially. Yeah, you know, that that one, the Apollo 17 picture with the scientists on the moon, and, you know, I did a few shows with that, and then, like, literally, I think it was two or three days after one of the shows that I did, they updated the page and, and changed it. But I had some of my detractors going, oh, you know, notice what Skiba didn't show. And what they did was they, they did the same thing that I did, zoomed in on the Earth, changed the adjusted, uh, the, uh, the, the um, what do you call levels. it, the contrast and levels, yeah. and, and it showed the rectangle around the Earth. But then they zoomed out to show all the other pixelation in the rest of the picture. And yeah, as if I didn't do that, too. Of course I did that. But yeah. the problem is, if you look at the pixelation around the rest, of the, around the astronaut and the buggy and everything else, the pixelation, yes, while it's square and blocky, generally follows the shape of the object that is pixelated around. Yeah. Whereas you have this oval, you know, uh, earth that has a totally rectangular box around it. Didn't have this the the characteristic square blocking following the shape of the oval like yeah. everything else did. And that was the point that I was trying to make. It wasn't I was like, "Oh, I was too afraid to show the rest of the picture." Like, really? Like I didn't think of that? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, and they were ignoring it. and that was a great find by you, by the way, where they're ignoring the fact that you 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 called them on it and then they changed it. Uh, I've never seen a group like like NASA and and on those and the 
contractors around them make so many moves in one year. You know, like again, like they're responding. Patricia jokes, you know, they're dancing to our music, but they are. You know, every time we catch something, it's like, okay, deal with this. Okay, fix that. Okay, try to, you know, let's see if see if we can just cover it and cover our tracks as much as we can. And that was a that was a great catch by you. And also, uh, Jaron on his uh, Globe Buster show when they do the live uh, viewing of the International Space Station uh, yeah. on YouTube. Uh, they often point out anomalies in the the video that they're watching live ISS footage, and then later the camera angle is often changed soon after. So yeah. they're some they've got somebody actually watching Jaron, who's assigned yeah. and paid to watch Jaron and change and tweak things so that uh, they won't get busted. It's it's pretty. It's actually complimentary to all the people that are involved in the Flat Earth Movement that we can make them change and adjust and do whatever we want, kind of like (laughs) they've treated us like we're puppets on a string, but we can kind of throw it back at them now, and they're the puppets sometimes. I think that that's the reason why they said, oh, yeah? Okay, fine. Here's 10,000 pictures. Deal with (laughs) it. Well, yeah, yeah, but then they do the – yeah, excellent point. Well, like when they released that first first picture uh, back in the end of July – but then they released it, and they they released it in ma- mainstream media, and they happened to mention they had the White House tweet it, and they had Neil deGrasse Tyson tweet it, and they said, "Oh yeah, by the way, this is the first blue marble shot we've done in forty three years." It's like y- you just confirmed everything we've been talking about for months. Where it's like there's no pictures of the Earth in space, and now you're going to come out and say, "Oh yeah, by the way, there's no pictures of the Earth in space." Here's some. <laughs> Let's do that. It was incredible. And then of course, you know, they hid the the sex thing in there, which was brilliant. You know that was that's old school Disney and and uh, you know a few others. and the shot was terrible on top of it and then you caught you know the moon shot and I know you you're kind of humming and hawing on the moon thing but you got to admit even the 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 stop frame action uh, of the moon okay. thing was was straight out of South Park yeah well I mean I did release the video debunking myself uh, yeah because I, I I've been looking for that you know I've remained on everybody knows obviously I'm I'm putting out a lot of material on the flat Earth stuff because I'm very interested in. I'm very intrigued by it. I'm finding stuff. I'm going, hey, look at this. Um, But I've remained uncommitted because I'm looking for that one rock solid, you know, debunk this, I dare you, um, piece of evidence. And I thought that was it for sure, man. I'm like, this is it. This is the one. And no, I I did some experiments. Well, I'm trying to be objective here. So, you know, I'm, I am, I'm out here in my hallway after hours, you know, I'm waiting sure everybody's out of here, but (laughs) (laughs) it's, doing all this little experiments and i you know i played around with it and got the set the cameras up and i realized oh okay i'm wrong in this but i was only wrong in the sense of what i said where if you're standing on the moon the earth should be covering the entire sky that yeah. part was not true there's way a lot of other things wrong with that uh that sure. picture sure but it's still but they still should well yeah yeah that 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 whole sequence was terrible yeah. but but you are right that the moon or the earth should be a lot bigger from from the moon it should be in fact the artist rendering that they did, you know, they, they, all sorts of artist depictions before we actually went, supposedly went there. And they said, oh, yeah, the, the Earth's going to be huge. It's going to be really, really cool. And But they had to stay, you know, once they screwed it up in the beginning, they had to keep screwing it up, which is why I released uh, to music, to some uh, guy's song that he put out, the, all the JAXA foot, footage from uh, the Japan Space Agency, where, you know, there's the moon, the, the Earth rise, and it's, it's even, it's, it's as, as bad or worse than the Apollo stuff. I was like going, oh, it's just terrible. Ugh. Well, if we, if all of the, well, not even if, all of the different space agencies from all of the different countries are all in on faking space, yeah. of course. However, even if, they, even if they are, why can't they get it together to show one version of what the moon looks like? At least help each other out to keep the lie going. I'm glad they don't because it makes it more obvious to the casual observer that something's going wrong. But why aren't they smart enough to... Have space look the same for every country. Part of, part of me thinks they're they're lazy, and you know different organizations because they all have to you know basically funnel through NASA and then the AST, the um, Aeronautical and Space Transportation Bureau. But eh, the other part is it's like you know I I still got this nagging feeling in my head that part of them wants to get caught, and I don't know why, and that part is bugging me uh, because yeah, there's some glaring things like the the ISS stuff. All the stuff that's you know all that production stuff that's been happening on the interior of the ISS, the International Space Station is is horrendous. And for for even junior level uh, production people, you you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to get away with some of that stuff. And I just can't. It's like why why would you make it that glaring? 
uh, unless unless there's something else behind it. But I, why I, would they want to get caught? I mean, it sounds like uh, the cheating husband or wife leaving their cell phone unlocked on the dining room table and saying, "Honey, I'm just going out to walk the dog for a couple of hours." I yeah. mean, what's the purpose of yeah. getting caught? What yeah. do they expect to have happen if they're caught? <laughs> it part part of it. I, I've got a couple of theories on it, but my big one is that is that this would be a big catalyst for them to initiate something bigger. I just don't know what bigger is in this case. That's that's what's stretching my mind, and that is, well, if Flat Earth is the setup if for the big right hook, the big punch, boy, the, I, the big punch, I, I'm, I'm still reeling and trying to figure out what that might be. I mean, I got, you know, again, a couple ideas. I don't really want to say them right now, though. So Well, you know. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, no. I want to hear them. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I keep All sticking. right. Stay, stay. I'm going to try to stay on Earth at this point. So, <laughs> okay. Rob, Rob's show. I know if he wants me to go down that road, I will. But maybe later. Well, maybe. Uh, um, I'm watching this show on. Uh, well, I'm watching it on Amazon right now. But I think it was on Hulu. Uh, called Manhattan: A Nuclear Family. It's uh, yeah. it's kind of a fictional version. I get well, sort of based on true story of the Manhattan Project. Mm-hmm. And I watched the documentary on the making of it and how the the writers did just a ton of research and interviewed people who lived out there during the project and tried to make it as historically accurate even though they're you know they're 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 blending characters to you know make characters and things like that mm-hmm. out of it. And the thought occurred to me, I mean, if you look into the Manhattan project, I mean, it's something like 130,000 people at a budget of in today's terms of I forget what it was like, let's say 26 billion or something. It was pretty yeah. high. Yeah. And yet the guy in the office next door had no clue what you were doing. Yeah. The, the vice president of the United States had no clue what was going on. The general public of the whole world had no clue what was going on. So that is like a microcosm and a perfect example of compartmentalization and how a secret could be kept by very few. And and the show does a good job of showing what happens if you, even if you told your spouse. Yeah. You know, because I hear people all the time, well, if this is a conspiracy, you know, how can they keep it quiet? And Zach Bauer put out a video. I don't know if you know who he is, but he was in the people who study the Torah. He and I are two recognizable names out on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the people who study Torah that are sympathetic to the flat earth thing, they're all rallying behind me. And the people who think this is crazy, this is stupid, this is ludicrous, they're rallying behind him. And he had me on his show. He had watched your stuff. Yeah. And he even admits, he's like, you know, I watched Mark's stuff, the, the uh, flat earth clues, and I watched some of Rob's stuff. And I got to tell you, for a little while, I was tracking down that page. <laughs> and he said, but... I always say, you know, when you hear an opinion, make sure you listen to the other side of the opinion. But this is what happened to him. We've all had the, let's just say, the opinion of the globe since kindergarten. So did any of us ever look for the other side to to test that theory or anything? No, none of us did. So what he did is, I'm going to go ahead and test this. But he got his feet wet. He said, ooh, I don't think I like that. And watched a bunch of Flat Earth debunk videos. Yeah. Uh, most of which I could knock out just myself back in April when I first got started on this. The, the one everybody's seen, the 10 reasons why we know the Earth is a globe. Yeah. I, I felt like I could knock out 8 of the 10 really easily. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the arguments aren't that great. So it seemed to me that Zach backed out of it. But he put out a video that said the five reasons why he believes that the Earth is globe, you know. And his number one was, was it, the conspiracy is just too big. What, what's your thought on that? Physically, yeah, it is too big, absolutely, which is why it's, it's so abrasive to people, why it sends people for such a loop. And I know where he's going with this, and that is it's so big that you could – there'd be too many people involved, and somebody would figure it out, and you know, it, it, would, it would get out. Unfortunately – or I should say, fortunately, for these for the people that are trying to cover it up, compartmentalization is really, really easy in this case. And I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of how easy it is to keep a secret, especially in the military. And this is we're talking about a military organization. NASA is not Starfleet. Got to stress that to anyone listening out there. NASA is they may wear white uniforms yeah. and smile for the camera, and they don't carry guns, but they are a military wing of the United States government. Their entire system was built on missile technology. In fact, they're unique in that they were built on the ashes of the Nazi war machine. 
if there's one group that is absolutely 100% military, it's those guys. But what I was going to say was, as far as compartmentalization goes, if you go back, uh, like the U-2 spy plane, for example, we did not have a U-2 spy plane, right? In fact, there's a movie just recently that came out. I did not watch it, but I know the story behind it. We did not have a spy plane until one was shot down over Russia. And then it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we have a spy plane, right? Mm -hmm. And then when they replaced it, they supposedly didn't replace it with anything. And then all of a sudden, you know, then I'll give you a perfect, the SR-71 Blackbird, everybody knows what that thing is, went from drawing board to retirement, its entire lifespan and nobody knew about it until the air, you know, until they rolled it out and says, oh, yeah, by the way, we're decommissioning the SR-71 spy plane. And we're like, what are you talking about? What, what spy plane? <laughs> you got a spy plane? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. It's really cool looking. It's black. It flies, it flies really fast. And I remember the press conference because they asked the Air Force general. They said, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, what are you going to replace it with? He goes, oh, nothing. <laughs> We're not going to replace it with anything. We're not going to do spy planes anymore. I was going, oh, my God, you're doing it again? Really? Uh, and people are just and, – and, of course, that's what the mass media has to write down. You know, They can't speculate and they say, well, he told us there's not going to be more spy planes, but we all know there's going to be spy planes because that's the whole point. It's a secret – bit you know it's a secret thing no different than area 51 you know we all know it's out there you know we people have been taking pictures at a distance but it's a secret base so they can't officially admit you know anything along those lines when it comes to this but yeah your your friend uh, yeah it's a monstrous conspiracy but at the highest levels and I'll, i'll use this i'll use the um uh the astronauts that supposedly are up there now and that is they're different from the apollo astronauts where i think they got a lot smarter I think the Apollo astronauts were told not only that they were faking it, but why, and it and it just sunk into their souls, and they didn't know what to do with it because a lot of people don't know how to deal with this. But everyone that's on the on the supposedly on the ISS now and faking this stuff, remember, there's only like 50 of these people in the whole world. They're just Air Force employees, so all they you know they just go up to these guys and make them sign a non disclosure agreement and say, oh yeah, by the way, you're going to be faking something. We're going to be paying you okay, and you do not have the clearance. It's above your pay grade to even ask why you're faking it. And that way, they can smile and you know float around in their and their dockers and their polo shirts and their socks around the ISS, and not have a care in the world, and and everything's great. They do, they don't they just look so normal and nice and yes. they don't look devious and evil and I know that you know there's such a thing as actors and in yeah. many movies and TV shows this is what they do for a living but they don't even look like actors I look at them and I think they are they mind controlled to believe that they're on the International Space Station. And then I think that they can't be because when they do spacewalks, they're done in a pool, so they yeah. have to know that they're well, not really out in space. But overall, their conscience is clear because, you know, they – yeah, they know they're faking something. They just don't know why. Now, they probably suspect, but ignorance is bliss. It always has been. And so these guys are like, you know what? We don't need to know, whatever it is. Because you know, they, maybe they went to a supervisor and the supervisor said uh, – uh, oh, yeah, it's national security. We're doing this for super secret reasons. We can't tell you. Or maybe they'd make up something. Maybe it's like, look, there's alien ships up there and they're going to blow the hell out of us if we go up there. So you got to fake this. You know, There's all sorts of cover stories they could give these guys. Whatever they're giving them, though, it's working because these guys are going through. They don't seem to have a guilty bone in their body. Uh, and everything's fine. And if you don't mind, Rob, I'd like to tie this to one of my other guests that I had. Uh, he had, in fact, he was anonymous. He made, it was the um, uh, industrial engineer that specialized in valves and seals. And he made, you know, he had me read this statement and he went on record and saying, look, he's going, I've looked at the ISS from a, from a blueprint type of standpoint. And he goes, there's only very few companies in the world that deal with industrial grade uh, seals and valves for, you know, like, especially for the military, especially submarines. And he says, this, uh, the ISS cannot function the way it functions from an engineering standpoint. There should be parts breaking down constantly. These guys should not be going around in khakis and, and uh, polo shirts. They should have wrenches on and spacesuits and be fixing things all the time. And and they should be have a concerned look on their face because some of these systems are critical. Not only and and he goes, there's there's so many things about that, you know, from the oxygen scrubbing system to the pressurization to uh, you know all the valves, all the seals. He's going, it should not happen. It, it's not as advertised. Whatever's going on there, he's going. I goes, I don't know what I'm looking at when I'm looking at the ISS, but it's not it's not flying hundreds of miles above the Earth. He knows that very much. Well, you- how does? Oh, sorry, Rob, you go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I the, one of the guys you had, I think it was the um, 
submarine guy. Yeah. Um, he was talking about the um, the pressure issue. Yeah. Every time they have to scrub the, you know, because they're breathing out carbon dioxide, so you have to filter that stuff. And, and he said anytime they would vent that stuff, they would lose pressure. Yeah. And so they're like, well, how are they repressurizing in an atmosphere that has no pressure? Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. Excellent point. Yeah, because on a submarine, which is very, very similar in theory to the ISS, you know, because it's a vacuum, you know, versus uh, underwater where, you know, you still, you know, there's there's heavy, heavy water pressure. He's going, there's two things we can do. We can, because we have all the power in the world down there because it's a, a nuclear sub, you can create, you know, you can, you can separate oxygen and hydrogen and make your own atmosphere. <clears throat> but then the, the other thing which I loved was he, he said, where's the machine shop? On top of that, where where he goes, the submarine needs to. And in fact, it's not just a submarine; every navy ship has one. You have to build parts from scratch, from from metal. And he goes, there should be a full blown machine shop on that thing. And they're really, really heavy, and they generate a lot of smoke and sparks, and they should just cause all sorts of problems with the atmosphere system. He goes, where is this thing? It doesn't exist. He's going, how are they making stuff for the uh, you know for the tolerances for these really you know for a, a pure vacuum environment? It, it, it just well, blew his mind. Wouldn't it, wouldn't the counter to that be? Well, what do you think all those shuttles are doing? <clears throat> you know, they're bringing up what shuttles? Are, they shut they shut down the shuttle program years ago. The only thing that's going up there now is the random rocket. I, I don't even know. I, I know that SpaceX supposedly docked, which means they're in on it now. Virgin Galactic. What have they done? Uh, I don't think they've done anything up there. So you no, know, no, no. He was saying he was saying that they should be putting parts up there all the time every month should be a truckload of parts because it's you treat it no different than you would an airliner and people don't know this about airlines but they don't wait for a part to break because you know you got people in there you don't want people dying so they, it's based on time so every uh, so many hours you have to swap out the parts that, and you know and and eventually strip the whole thing down yeah i, I was a helicopter um, oh yeah you know this yeah i was a helicopter mechanic for uh, the whole time I was in the military, and six of those years I was a pilot, but I maintained my full-time job uh, as a mechanic because before I wanted to go to flight school and fly the thing, I wanted to know why it flew and how yeah. it flew because, you know, when I'm in the thing, I want to know, okay, if I hear that funky sound or feel that whatever that doesn't quite feel right, I want to be able to troubleshoot this in my head. Yeah. And it's true. You ha- we had what they, what they call daily inspections um, where you always had to do kind of a quick check. You, you had pre-flight inspections. You had seven-day inspection, 21-day inspection, 30-day. Yep. You had, you know, uh, and they would have this, I think it was, if I remember, this goes going way back now, 25, 30 years. But I think it was a uh, 300-hour inspection, uh, if I remember the time right. I, it, but it was called phase inspection where you basically take the thing apart. Yeah. And, and, you know, put it back together again and you put a whole bunch of new stuff on it. And, you know, but you really go through a thorough check of everything. And that's just on a helicopter that was older than I am. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to your point, yeah, this, the big strip down, he called it. And he goes, he goes what, what are they doing with the ISS? You know, and multiple people have told me that. There's like, look, that thing, you should, be, you should have the big strip down, the big overhaul time where it's like you just start taking – in fact, you have to basically – would have to bring in a whole nother ISS just to have the guys from the first one strip down, you know, have that thing stripped down. You, you'd never be able to do it with the one you have up there. So, How do the oxygen scrubbers work though? I know that cleans the air, but do they have to have new air – oxygen tanks or something brought up yeah. and then that's, replenished when does yeah, that happen th- that's the pres- pressurization problem which uh, uh the submarine guy because he deals in pressurization all the time oh crap we're going to break aren't we Ooh, uh, we got about 40 seconds here so oh, okay. yeah uh well he, he but, was say, he was saying that he's going look those tanks have to be brought up there on a regular basis there's not enough oxygen there's not enough air pressure with what they have for the amount of people that they have they're burning through it No hate, no hype, no fear. Real people, real radio.
We're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. For the second hour of the broadcast, I'm talking with my guests, Mark Sargent from Strange World and Patricia Steer from Flat Earth and other hot potatoes. And right before the break, we were discussing the International Space Station. And uh, I've got somebody on my Facebook page who said, um, we'll be interesting to see how you explain this one, Rob. The International Space Station, which doesn't exist apparently, will transit the moon. Are you going to have a look? And there's a Facebook uh, picture here posted. Uh, apparently, this thing's going to be seen from uh, Brisbane at 7:36 Saturday, the 21st of November. Um, there, I've seen plenty of of pictures that people have taken, uh, both s- still photos as well as videos of this thing going across the moon. Yep. So it appears there's something there. Yep. What's your take on that? Um. <clears throat> I, I, I'd, I'd love to address this because I get this question all the time. That is, yes, I absolutely believe there is something up there that looks like the International Space Station. Do I think there's something up there? Yes. Do I think there are people on it? No, I do not. Not by any stretch of the imagination. So the question then comes up, which is, for your guy there, why would you fake – if you have something up there, why are you faking people on it? And by that, you know, look up. You don't even have to go very far. Go on YouTube. Look up ISS hoax. It's easy to find videos. There's a bunch of them. It's been dissected now for months, uh, if not the last year, uh, especially the recent footage. It, and it's not getting any better, except that the women did cut their hair, which, thank God, they took my recommendation. Thanks, guys, on that. Yeah. But if they're faking that, then why, you know, why are they doing it? The only reason they, is fa- they would fake the people on it is because they can't put them up there. And if they can't put them up there, there's something – that they can't do at that altitude. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there's something transiting. Yeah, you can. You, there's a tracker and there's some light that flies across. Do I think it's an actual space station full of people? No, not a chance. And by the way, that also puts into question satellites, which I'm, I'm getting more and more fond of saying that because people say, well, what about satellites? Because people don't like to let go of everything at once. They let go of things in stages. And I say, look, if I can't trust the ISS footage, the interior footage, then how can I trust satellites? And more importantly, you got to think of us like, well, are satellites real? It's going, really? Who told you there were satellites in the first place? The same guys that said they went to the moon? Because NASA's in charge of all the satellite telemetry. Look it up. It all goes through the AST. Uh, I, I think, yeah, do, are there people that make satellites and shoot them up there? Yeah. Yeah, sure. But when they get up to a certain point, I think NASA takes over the telemetry. I think the rocket gets wiped out, and then the, all the communications are routed through the old Loran system. Well, that's the interesting thing, though, because e- right through the Apollo program, even up to the current Orion program, mm-hmm. they tell you that as soon as the spaceship, rocket, or what have you, goes yeah. over the Indian Ocean, they lose contact. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, if you've got satellites, you know, 40,000 whatever satellites out there and all this GPS, why are you telling me that in the 21st century you still are losing contact with your spacecraft over the Indian o- Ocean? That's awfully con Convenient. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and you're talking about the the uh, the same Orion video that that I've seen and we've all seen yeah. now at this point, which is you know that the blonde uh, guy Kelly Smith, uh, who looks like he's from an Aryan youth movement, he comes on and he go they go into it's not a short video they go into painstaking detail about the Orion program and there's some real inconsistencies there. One is yes, how it drops off telemetry over the Indian Ocean for no apparent we we we're going to lose contact with these guys and that's completely expected. And it's like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? There's there's a million satellites up there. You can't you can't reroute a few things. There's not supposed to be dead spots. And then of course the other one, which I I'm waiting. I am waiting for whatever astrophysicist wants to come back on this, where where he talks about the Van Allen belts, mm-hmm. where he says, oh yeah, you know, we're the first Orion things that we're going to send up there are going to be unmanned, full of sen- sensors because we need to figure out how to deal with the Van Allen uh, the radiation belt problem. And, and he actually says that outright. And there's a graphic to, to coincide with it. That's he right. had to have gotten fired after saying that. Speaking well, no, no, well, no, Kel, good point. But Kelly didn't write that, you know, the, the guy that's on there. I mean, the guy's, what, 26, 27? That's true, true. But, but whoever wrote it, it's like, what, why would you ever say that? Because you're saying, oh, yeah, we still have to do – the reason why we're not sending manned men, uh, you know, p- p- past this point is because can't we deal with the radiation problem? It's like, what are you talking about? You, 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 you solved that back on Apollo 8. Apollo 8 through Apollo 17, round trips, that's 10 missions back and forth. Nobody died. Nobody got radiation sickness. Nobody got cancer. None of the capsules were uh, contaminated. They're all sitting in the Smithsonian. How, how, you, you solved it back then. What are you doing now? I mean, 
uh, honestly, this should stop any astrophysicist dead in his tracks, and that should be it. That should be the end of the argument right there. At that point, they're going to they're gonna go home and cry and start drinking. Sorry. We were yeah. talking about satellites earlier, and Arthur C. Clarke is the one who invented satellites. I mean, that's a sci-fi writer. Uh, he, in, in, in the 40s, he put it in, into his writings. And uh, then, of course, NASA comes up with satellites, yeah. and businesses come up with satellites later, but taking their cue from a sci-fi writer. People yeah. don't really consider that when they start defending satellites. They're a fantasy. This is a question that I've had, and of course, uh, you know, everybody's shooting back at me. Now, look, I'm an artist, I'm a writer, filmmaker, I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree, but, yeah. you know, I think I've got a pretty decent brain for research and can look at stuff, but I get tripped up on math and things like that. That's not my strong point. Sure. But when you talk about things like satellites, and, you know, NASA will tell you, you look at the various websites that talk about satellites, that they're up in the thermosphere. And yeah. So I look up the thermosphere, and it says it gets to it can get up to five thousand degrees in the thermosphere. Yeah, hence the name. Yeah, Therm- Yeah, it's hot. That's why they call it that. So, yeah. uh, you know, so I'm going. Wait a minute, you guys in the mainstream media told me that three buildings essentially, you know, began the steel began to melt and it fell into free fall speed into a pile of ash in their basements. Yeah. After burning for less than an hour at temperatures below two thousand degrees. So how the heck are these satellites made from uh, a lot less durable material, as far as I can tell, uh, surviving 5,000 degree temperatures or thereabouts between 2,000, let's just say between 2,000 and 5,000 degrees for months and years at a time? I don't, and they're all saying, well, because the atmospheric pressure, uh, they're, they're giving me all this line. I'm not smart enough to figure it out, but they're, they're telling me that this atmospheric pressure thing or whatever – uh, it, it's a dry heat, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There aren't enough molecules to conduct the energy. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're saying. It's like really, really. That that's how that's where you're going to do it. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's well, a bunch. Of, well, I'll I'll take it one more. For, and that is, you know, I mean, you've seen some of the charts out there. I mean, it, depending on which one you look at, there's anywhere between what seven thousand and twenty thousand satellites. Again, depending on which list you're looking at. And and if you see like the real time pictures, it's like the thing is bristling, like uh, like the that scene from Wally when he leaves the Earth, and you know he just had bouncing through all these satellites on the way out because there's that many, and yet none of these satellites are taking pictures of each other. Uh, and the, when there's a meteor shower, and we get meteor showers all the time, everybody you know ma- mainstream news, okay, well, go out and watch the meteor shower, kids, it'll be great. When that happens, nobody's concerned about the satellites. You know, these things should be getting knocked out of the sky, uh, you know, like a shooting gallery on a regular basis. And, and, and there's uh, no satellites being photographed whenever they take any pictures from the International Space Station. Never a single satellite in sight. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. The, the time lapse. You'd think they'd either be below or above. You'd think you'd see, especially when the sunlight starts gleaming off these things, because we all know they're super polished metal. You should be seeing little flashes all the time. Yeah. When people say they're in the thermosphere, oh, well, that's too low. But they're also supposedly in the exosphere, which is, which is higher, too. So they should be spotted in some of NASA's footage, and zero so far have ever been seen. Yeah. They're going to put them in there eventually. You know they will. Well, yeah, they're getting, well, yeah, they're yeah. working on that. They're, they're oh. going to try, but they're always, <laughs> they're going to. They, oh, we got to cover that one. Well, the the big one though, and, and you addressed this in one of your things, which was uh, uh, the 1990 Galileo shot, which they've never replicated since 1990, and that is the rotating Earth on its axis. Even now, yeah, they say fine. We've got a, a Japan satellite that's in geostationary orbit, and, and it shows the sun, you know, moving right. But it's but the Earth isn't rotating; it's sitting in one spot. It's like no, what? Where where is a satellite even now? You know, the the only one was in 1990, and we even got a, a video. It's in my short list where a guy calls up NASA, pretended to be a movie producer. And he asked them if if there's any shots of the Earth rotating for space. And the guy, and this is the guy to talk to for as far as trademark footage goes and stuff to use in the movies. He goes, yeah, we don't have it. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, so even the 1991 doesn't count? Why is there no picture from a distance of the Earth rotating for space? And the best they could come up with was the thing you saw where the moon south parked in front of the, the Earth. <laughs> south Park. that's, that's the best thing they got. Well, it's like five yeah. frames. It's like chunk, 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 chunk. Well, you get, we got more out of that than we got out of the Pentagon footage for the 9-11. Good point. Yeah, you only got three frames out of that. How oh. did they get pictures of Pluto, which is in the blackness of space? Uh-oh. I mean, complete. Okay, how do they get a perfectly lit photo of something that's supposedly spinning with a, a vehicle that's actually moving, that's perfectly lit. Where do the lights come from? Yeah. 
Oh, Do they have right. spotlights on it or something? Yeah, you, <laughs> really? You're gonna you're gonna go that far? Well, you're gonna you're gonna slow pitch that one. Uh, how about the Mars rover? The, the Mars rover battery batteries do not last that much past expiration. That especially everyone knows a car battery. Once it's dead, it's dead, right? And the Mars rover is what six years now past expiration. It's just tooling around. They're driving. They're taking pictures. Probably in New Mexico or Arizona, but. <laughs> they're just BB back shots all the time. The it's co- like, yeah, let's just extend that mission. Nobody seems to notice, so let's just keep it going. Yeah, off that Canadian island off to the west of uh, Greenland. Oh, yeah, that. Oh, yeah, that's right, because you zoomed in on some of that stuff too, didn't you? Yeah, well, I, it was, uh, I think, Jaronism. Jaron found, yeah. He found it, and I was like, really? So, you know, I, I'm always double-checking everything you guys are putting out. Anytime I see I'm like, really? So I want to I look into it too. Uh, and and there, here's another one you may not be aware of. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you are. But I posted something on my Facebook a while back of a uh, an area of moon craters, yeah. and I say, "Hey, you guys, what do you think of this uh, picture of the moon craters?" And it was a loaded question because I knew it wasn't really moon craters. It was sure. a picture taken of Cinder Lake in Arizona, and um, I've got the coordinates on that um, thirty nine degrees by I don't know what is it nineteen hours nineteen point seven one north by one hundred and eleven degrees thirty one minutes five point eleven west. And you can go on Google Earth, I'm on it right now looking at it, and see the craters of the moon in Arizona. And I've seen a video, there was a video that was put out not too long ago, I don't think. It was uh, debunking NASA debunkers. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and uh, it was these guys trying to show, you know, because all the people are saying we never went to the moon. And they were saying, oh, yeah, we did. And, and it, this was a video to debunk the debunkers. Yeah. But in this video, they actually kind of shoot themselves because – they set up a um, shop in, in the desert somewhere, and they're shooting at night, and they got a guy dressed up in a, as an astronaut, and they got a little buggy, and they got all this stuff. And, redo- and I'm like, put a black and white filter on that? You guys just proved the point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to do a dig on you on this one because you were, you were the first one that said that I shouldn't have led with uh, the empty theater about no movies ever being made of space. Yeah. And but I think it's still I still think it's a valid point, and that is if you let Hollywood or even nowadays, especially you know since camera technology, you could independent film guys are everywhere. If you let those guys try to make a moon movie, there's going to be too many aha moments. We're going, wow, you know the thing we just made that looks really really like what was just shown. It's like it's like how do we because it blurs the lines too much. You don't know the difference, which is why you can't allow it to happen. The closest you can get is something like gravity. Where you know it's it's just above the Earth and you're kind of floating around space and you're doing stuff you can't you know why why are you making that and not going to the moon it just drives me insane yeah gravity there's I, I finally got around to putting a page I'm just, you know again I'm trying to be objective here so on my testingtheglobe dot com website in the video resources tab mm-hmm. there's been a link there for really since day one called globe favoring videos but for all this time it, I I didn't have anything on there. Yeah. So I thought, okay, after Zach Bauer did his thing, I'm like, you know, he did a, he he made a good effort, uh, in my opinion, to try to you know speak. He his- seems like a good guy. I've seen his videos. You know, he he's seems awesome. like a, he's smart. I mean, I I like him. And when he was try- when he was kind of going flat for a while, I was like, yeah, he's going to be the next flat earther. But like you were saying in a, in their earlier segment, he definitely. I believe found some truth to it and decided to actually pull back and because the the, the things that he came up with as his belief system that uh, we live on a ball were pretty weak. Yeah, he, I think he just he got scared, backed off of it. Um, well, you know, when I was on his show and we were talking about this, I know that he got blasted. He got assaulted by a lot of people saying, "How dare you? This is oh, you're a disgrace. Why did you have Skiba on here? Blah blah blah. We'll never support your ministry." And you know, people just went psycho on him. <laughs> so you know, I, I get it. I mean, but Zach's cool. I mean, he's a he's a great guy. He's a friend of mine. Uh, love the guy. Just think he's wrong in, in this regard. Uh, even though I haven't been fully committed yet myself, he his his the points that he made, in my opinion, are very easy to knock out. But there is one video that I have to say is quite convincing. Uh, well, there's two, actually, that I, I liked it from the globalist side. One is Flat Earth and NASA host, uh, hoax debunk slam dunk. You've probably seen it. <laughs> there's some interesting things in there. Um, you know, there's stuff I certainly could argue uh, against, but there's another one, How It Works, the International Space Station, 800, uh, or 1080, uh, whatever, 1080p, 60 frames per game. second. Um, that one's pretty good. It's like 28 minutes and uh, 58 seconds. 
and it's the the Medusa woman floating yep. through the International Space Station, and it's you know it's a thirty minute video with you know very few cuts, so it's yep. it's you're not dealing with the vomit comet here, you're dealing with you know something else. But mm-hmm. I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, now wait a minute. Th- I'm looking at this saying this is very convincing. I will admit it's very con- there are anomalies in there that don't make sense, but it's convincing. However, when I googled the NASA budget for uh, next year in the tens of billions of dollars, I think it was 16 billion or something, whatever it was, um, lots of money in the billions. And then I went and googled the uh, um, the budget of gravity, which I saw in, on IMAX in 3D. Yeah. So. I mean, I felt like I was with Sandra floating around out there, you know, watching this movie. I'm like, wow. And that movie's made for $100 million. Yeah. It was every bit as believable, if not more believable, than Medusa hair woman. And so I'm going, you know, if this is a hoax, if it is a scam, if this ISS stuff is not real, then at this day and age, it is very easy to fake it. Star Wars was made for $11 million. $11 mm-hmm. million. I posted this on my Facebook this morning. Star Wars, if you look at Star Wars, even, even the original cut where you could still see the mat uh, around the spaceships was amazing. You know, $11 million. What can these guys do for $16 billion if they wanted to? Yeah. Good point. Well, didn't they have uh, actual bathrooms with showers in previous uh, space vehicles? And then now they have to give themselves sponge baths on the ISS and they have that weird toilet with some kind of a weird urine sucking device (laughs) that they all use. Uh, But but, but, uh, what was it? Uh, What's it called? I can't think of its name that also went up. Uh, th- there's a prior prior version of the International Space Station. Anybody coming up with uh, it quickly? Mir? Oh, SpaceX or Mir? Um, no, no, no. I'm talking about another uh, thing that we would that we would go up there and live on. Well, they had showers on it. It was Mir, wasn't it? Oh, oh the Mir Space Station. Well, that whatever it was, they actually had real showers, and now they don't have that ability with the International Space Station. So, what have we gone backwards technology wise? Uh, the bathrooms themselves, to me, say no one's aboard the ISS. Nobody would live in those conditions. Yeah, uh, it just... would. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of videos out on YouTube now. Uh, not only the grunginess, horrible part, which would drive Patricia to drink, but <laughs> the um, but the water flying around. Uh, there was this one recently where she was like showing people, like some news people, like Good Morning America, how the shower works and and all this stuff, and she's right next to a to a, a power transformer on the wall. And it's not covered with anything. It's just sitting there. And in fact, and they knew this because in one of the previous videos, they were showing them installing one of these power transformers. And, you know, there's water droplets flying around in front of the camera. I was going, are you kidding? You'd never go anywhere. She's literally like six inches from this thing. And uh, yeah, you wouldn't be able to contain everything. It would be, you'd have to go into an entirely separate room, which again, it's one of my pet peeves, which is, if there are doors, right, if there are hatches for these things, why are they never, ever shut or even look like they could be shut uh, on on any sort of quick basis? If it's like a submarine, why is the entire thing open? And that, for me, screams the editing part, laziness, because if you want to maximize your, your anti-gravity shots, you, want, you don't want to spend time people opening doors and shutting doors. You want to kind of do the Sandra Bullock thing where you're just kind of flying through, the camera's following them, because if you have to stop and, and open us and shut it like a submarine, you know, and spin the wheel and whatever you have to do, pull the lever, it slows everything way, way down, and you just don't have time for it. But to Skylab. Your- Sorry to Sky interrupt you. Skylab. Skylab. That's what I was trying to think of. Wow, yeah, they had showers. Yeah. I mean, you know, they weren't showers like in your house, but they had actual showers. But – to to your your point, Rob, why why if they have the budget, why aren't they spending more on production value? I don't know. Uh, well, the, you're right, a lot they, of it's still going to. I mean, people are still getting paid to build machinery. There's they are building you know rockets and shuttles and things, and we're watching them being shot in the space. So obviously, a lot of that budget is going to physical, tangible equipment and you know salaries and stuff. Is is it possible that they have to recruit? You know, they they go to the lowest bidder. They go to a film school and they find, and they say, "All right, who's you know? Are you willing to sign this disclosure agreement and work with us? All right, how much you know? How much you willing to work for? You know?" And these guys come in there and they do what they can. I mean, again, remember if you believe the Matt Boland story, and I kind of do, uh, you know, they hired him 
straight out of college. It was like, it's like, what do you do? Well, I paint realistic planets and, you know, scapes and all this stuff. I can create organic painting. It's like, yeah, let's, let's go with him. Who knows what they were paying him. I'm guaranteeing it wasn't, you know, a million dollar salary. Well, you know, that's an interesting point too, because one of the arguments that Zach was saying, you know, is it would be impossible to keep all these people quiet. Well, my, my counter argument would be, first of all, there, you wouldn't have to keep a whole lot of people quiet no. because yeah. the car- compartmentalization alone only the people at the very top pulling the strings and the people who are actually allegedly in space doing stuff yeah. really i mean i just did a quick search on how many people have been to space and i found a, a source that said as of november 6 2013 a total of 536 people from 38 countries have gone into space according to the fai guide okay there's 7 billion people on the planet and 536 have supposedly been up there from 38 countries, probably all people who signed the Antarctic Treaty, yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> we suspect in my eyes because they would all be in on, you know, if there is a conspiracy, then those countries that signed the Antarctic Treaty would have to be in on it. But yeah. of the people that wouldn't have a clue that there even is anything being uh, yeah. hidden, it's yeah. very, very few. Yeah, yeah they, like directors and people operating cameras, really, and they could do some of that pretty simply with uh, uh, machines or some kind of robotic cameras, possibly. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the, the people like the Antarctic Defense Force, the guys that are flying the F-16s, you know, guarding the, um, uh, the Antarctic coastline, they don't know anything. You know, they're just flying around. It's like, don't, you know, shoot, t- tell us if you see any boats, and if they don't do what you, you, know, what you want them to, you see an un- un- unidentified aircraft, blow them out of the sky. They don't know why. You know, it's not like they're going to, hey, let's make a hard left turn and find out what's out there. You know, they're not going to they're not going to break the rules. That's the whole part about the military. You follow the orders. You you don't take the chances. And even if you did, you know, even if you knew, which I know I was kind of bold in saying that in one of my clues, who are you going to tell? Who are you going to go to? Because at that point, do you trust anybody? You going to go to the New York Times and, and say, by the way, you know, Earth's flat and here's here's my proof. You know, chances are you're going to be completely bugged and watched the entire time. They're going to watch your emails. They're going to watch your phone calls. Anybody that knows, they watch them to the point where even Admiral Byrd, uh, you know, he died in 1957, one year after Operation Deep Freeze. And, yeah. you know, he, he was on television quite a few times before then. And maybe they thought, you know what? He doesn't get to do another tour. Not if he disagrees with us. Maybe there was a meeting where he said, look, I think this is kind of important that people should know this. And, you know, maybe a vote was, was cast. I don't know. Well, Zach was saying, you know, because he's a graphic designer and so am I. You know, it's like, you know, all those guys are, you know, if all this stuff is supposedly fake, it's all artwork and stuff. Don't you think one of these artists would talk? I said, well, maybe. But, I mean, there's a lot of threats under compartmentalization for one thing. If you if you have to sign a nondisclosure, especially with the government. Uh, yeah. You know, and there could be good payoffs. It could be this, you know, stuff. But then you say, well, what about uh, Matt Boylan? Well, uh, you know, this guy, he's out there exposing this stuff, but he does it as a comedy shtick. Yeah. It, so, which is brilliant. <coughs> you can yeah. say, Look, I'm just a comedian. You don't have to believe me. I'm just making jokes here. Yeah. Um, but uh, go ahead. Well, Sorry. but but on the other side, um, he it's also brilliant because he immediately went very public with it. So, yeah. I mean, if you knock the guy off, then you just created you know, a martyr for the cause. But at the same time, now I'll throw this little wrinkle in there for, for people that want to know about the Matt Boylan story. Cause I think one of his video where he sat down on the couch and was very sober telling his whole thing was very, very good. It was the best thing he ever did. Uh, Thank his girlfriend for that, that sat him down. But he only told that story once. And on top of that, he couldn't, he, he, he knew all the names of the people, you know, he, the story goes when he was 25, you know, that he was hired by NASA to do this stuff. He knew the names of them. In fact, one particular, he said he was a high level NASA scientist that was also a really good organic painter, just like him. And he still, to this day, will not give out the names, even though he, you know, he's not married, doesn't have kids, anything like that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, there's intimidation does get into that because you, you get worried. You, you wonder, and, and this has been rattling around his head for a long time, and it probably didn't do him any good. There's also this, you know, Chuck Missler has referred to patriotism as basically a, a modern form of idolatry, and I would tend to agree with it, and especially people who go into the military at a young age. I went in, I was in boot camp a week out of high school, you know, graduating from high school, mm-hmm. and at that young age, you're impressionable, you join the service, you know, rah, rah, God and country, I want to be, you know, patriotic and yada, yada. You go there, and it's, you go through eight weeks of trauma-based mind control called boot camp, and, uh, and I mean, 
here I'm a, a touchy feely, artsy fartsy, you know, I don't even want to kill bugs kind of guy. I mean, my wife sees a bug, I get a cup and let it outside, you know. Sure. Uh, you know, and but yet I'm out there with a M16 and a bayonet, you know, slamming it into a, a you know, a representation of a human in, you know, doing my thing and stuff because you're you're brainwashed into thinking I'm serving my country and blah 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 and yeah. you could have told me to do almost anything f- to serve my country and I would be like, "Yep, where do I sign up?" You know, I'm in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think that can be used effectively against Absol- Absolutely. I think, you know, he was intimidated to the point where uh, it took him, he was told He was told when he was 25, and it took him almost 10 years before he even developed his comedy routine to try to get this out there. You know, and, and I think it took that long. You know, again, what, what your friend was saying, you know, it's such a massive concept that it takes a while for it to sink in. You know, I still get frustrated, but I understand completely when you tell people, you know, it takes some days before they adjust to it. Well, um, Neil Armstrong, back in 1994, it was the 25th, I guess, anniversary of the lunar landing. He made a big speech yeah. in front of students, big ceremony uh, commemorating the Apollo 11 missions. And he said something, you know, it took him a long time to come out and he didn't come out uh, exactly, but slightly did talking about lifting truth's protective layers. So a little bit of hint there. Rundown live with Mike and Kristen, Monday through Thursday on Truth Frequency Radio. Back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, for the final half hour segment of this broadcast. I'm talking with Mark Sargent from Strange World and Patricia Steer from Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. And right before the break, uh, Patricia, you were talking about Neil Armstrong, uh, and I've seen that video also where he's talking about truth's protective layers. And, you know, what, what really strikes me about, especially the Apollo astronauts, and, and I would say probably even Mercury and Gemini, uh, a lot of these guys were either Freemasons themselves related to somebody that is a Freemason or surrounded by Freemasons <laughs> while they're doing their thing. And, of course, just by nature, that's a, sec- uh, excuse me, a secret society. So naturally, these guys are good secret keepers. I mean, how convenient. But, w- I mean, going back even further to, like, when these guys first returned, allegedly f- returned from the moon, and they're having that press conference, I got to tell you, man, if you watch that probably like the first half hour almost – of it, and you listen to especially Neil when he's talking. He's got Freemasons on either side of him, and I've never been able to vet whether or not he actually was a Freemason himself. But the other two guys uh, were uh, definitely uh, Buzz. And but the way the camera angle was on Neil, it was like a, a you know kind of a three quarter shot on the right side of his face, and it, it almost if you listen to the way he talked, he would say a few words, kind of blink for a few minutes say a few more words and complete a sentence. It was almost like he had a, a bug, you know, earpiece in his left ear that the camera couldn't see and like he was being fed the lines or something. And they were all acting like total drones until they put the slides up on the screen. And all of a sudden they all became very animated, started talking. And I'm going, are we looking at MK Ultra here? Mm-hmm. That's a good way to think of it. Uh, I, they did look to me either very depressed threatened uh, if they didn't say what they were told to say or maybe you're right maybe mind control uh, hypnotized before they went out on stage well because it was almost like the, the 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 visuals were the triggers you know the manchurian candidate you know show them the card you know what i mean yeah 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 i i when i when i watched it uh and i was late to the game and watching that you know uh but when i saw it it really bothered me because you know, you know they had already gone through ticker tape parades by that point, 
And for men that had made it to the moon and back without dying, that alone, that big adrenaline rush, they should have been flying high for weeks. Uh, you know, just just on the energy. It's like, yeah, yeah, you know, we kicked ass on the moon right on. Yeah, and, like when uh, guys win football games, like a yep. Super Bowl or something. I mean, this is way larger than that, and they should have been that in that spirit, but instead they just look like somebody told them their dogs had been killed. Yeah, yeah. I would have been ricochet rabbit, man. I'd been spazzing out. You couldn't, oh, yeah. couldn't hold me down. Um, but I just real quick while we were just talking, I uh, did a quick search on MK Ultra. It says uh, the program began in the early 50s, was officially sanctioned in 53, was reduced in scope in 64, further cur- curtailed in 67, and officially halted in 73. Mm-hmm. Interesting. 67 through 73. Convenient. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the entire Apollo program. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it makes you wonder. I mean, it really, it really does. But when we come to the later missions, I mean, space shuttle, I don't really have a problem with the space shuttle deal. I mean, because they're not going anywhere. I mean, they're just, yeah. you know, skipping across the top of the atmosphere maybe. But that's about it. But when it comes to the International Space Station, I thought that, um, and Patricia, maybe you can talk to this, uh, uh, to this point, that Tiger Dan – brought up some really interesting possible ideas concerning how the ISS could be uh, functioning basically as, you know, something in a, in a levitation field. Yeah, he did. Um, it's Tiger Dan 925 on YouTube. Um, he is a Bible literalist pretty much, and he has a, a great sense of humor, and he has a really good YouTube channel, and he was talking to me on one of my uh, uh, interviews on Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes about what his thoughts are of what the ISS is, and he's thinking that there is some kind of studio somewhere, a big giant warehouse, where they have a model of the International Space Station, where they have some kind of a scrolling screen of all the shots of Earth and the like being shown so that it kind of appears as if the astronauts who are in this model are in space, and the the astronauts in the fake ISS actually believe they're in space. Yeah, and Mark. I don't know if I can believe that because how do they then do spacewalks hmm. unless they're MK Ultra? Well, uh, this is why I want to dovetail in something that Mark had mentioned uh, in one of the interviews. I don't know if it was on my show or your show, but you were talking yeah. about a, a British show called Space Cadets, and I did. I watched the whole thing on YouTube, and you know, I gotta say. Uh, they did a really good job with what yeah. they did with those poor people. And yeah. I would have been in my, uh, especially in my late teens or early 20s, I would have, I confess, I'd have been every bit as gullible and, and taken by it as those guys. I would have had my questions. I would have had my suspicions probably. Yeah. But I, the reason I joined the Army in the first place, the reason I stayed in for eight years was because my goal was to be an astronaut. And, uh. and, and my plan was to do my thing in the Army and fly helicopters, get that down, transition into the Air Force before uh, my 28th birthday, uh-huh. get into the JET program and put my application in for NASA. That was my, that was my plan, yep. wh- why I did it. So that would have been the prime time in my life, the same age these kids were. Yeah. Uh, to uh, you know, I would have been hook, line, and sinker on this deal. And if you, if you took that, I mean, they were on a very tight, small UK reality TV show budget. Yeah. But if you had a really you know, sixteen billion dollar budget, let's say, and you could do something like Space Cadets, but throw in the idea that um, Tiger Dan had, and yeah. I've been watching videos of levitation with sound and how all that works. If you were actually in <clears throat> a large enough space. Yeah. Have to be really big, and have to have some really good, um, you know, screens or whatnot to fake it yep. enough that it would deceive these astronauts even on the spacewalk. Then they would st- the spacewalk would still work, you know, yeah. in that yeah. levitational field. Yeah, potentially. Um, in fact, uh, there was a I, I can't remember if I, I remember talking to you about this, but the sci-fi original miniseries Ascension. Yeah. Which was that exactly that? What they did was, and for people that don't know what what space cadets is and is ascension thing is, it's basically the ultimate punked, which is you're punking people to believe that they actually went to space and they didn't by putting them in some sort of simulation. Uh, the space cadet thing was very small, but the sci-fi uh, series, which was which was totally fictional, was the whole thought that yeah, you're going to do this long distance, fifty year whatever journey into space into deep space. 
and you create this giant ship and then you put everybody into you know sleep during the initial liftoff and then you have these massive led screens which are kind of shaped like domes you know kind of like a clamshell type thing and when they're in there and the whole point is you can't let them know because the whole point is to see how they naturally act in 50 years of deep space, you know, to the point where they have families and those kids grow up and, and yeah. they, they man the ship. And it's fascinating because, it, because yeah, I completely understood the, the whole motivation for doing it. Because, but what, if you're going to do that, you're, you're, you're going to do it fake, but you can't tell them that you're doing it, which really dovetailed into what this was to me, this enclosed world system, this whole flat world system, which is the whole point was to make us, you know, it, to keep us acting naturally. Because human beings, because a lot of people say, well, why would I care? Why would anyone care, you know, if, if they actually found out that we were actually inside a giant Hollywood studio Truman Show type scenario? I was like, are you kidding? Human beings, for the same reason why Ascension didn't, human beings do not like being cooped up uh, for any situation. And they would – all anyone would care about. I mean, yes, yeah, some people wouldn't care. But a lot of people would be like that. So they'd just be constantly fixated. They'd be like, who built it? What's the, what's the intention? What's our role here? How much did it cost? How long has it been here? And then this question just keep going and going and going. That's all. They'd be upset, obsessed with it. I want out. And yeah, I want out. It's, you know. Well, you know, um, Space Cadets itself only cost uh, something like uh, five million pounds to do the whole show, to make the whole thing. And it was taken from some kind of a Hollywood. They, Hollywood basically built the vehicle itself. So if you think about that, that show and the show made, uh, I don't know, a couple, you know, every show was maybe almost $2 million that they made every show that they, they showed. So if they can do that just for a TV show, people wonder how they can afford, you know, NASA can afford to do what they do. NASA's oh, yeah. got plenty of money to afford it. The dollars. And the more I look into this levitation with sound waves things, mm -hmm. it starts to make sense because you, the, even in that video with the Medusa hair woman, she was talking about the need for them to work out because their bones and stuff get brittle and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if it was Tiger Dan or somebody else in another video was saying that if they were being constantly bombarded by sound waves, um, it would probably do the same thing. It would eventually uh, wear you down in, in similar ways. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. It's very possible. I liked, actually liked his theory on that. Uh, you know, and that is because there were some shots in the, in the ISS which you're trying to figure out. It's kind of like looking at a magic trick and you're trying to figure out how he did it. It's like you know all the normal tricks, yeah. you know, the wires, the green screen, uh, the, you know, the, the short parabolic flights in the vomit comet. But some of them are fairly convincing. And so you have to look. And, yeah, I, I actually liked his theory on that. Uh, if they, it was they may have something like a big – underground base or some kind of a big empty warehouse where they can do what we can't, which is create artificial gravity, not on a parabolic uh, flight, but like really in a building somehow yeah. with all yeah. the money they've got. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? I, all I know is there's, yeah, there's, it's it's very that there's still like anything, which is why I keep saying it's like yeah, you can talk about the mission to Mars all day long, but the internet detection, the the hive mind finds all the production flaws. It doesn't matter how much money you spend on a movie, yeah. they are going to find scenes which don't line up. They're going to find inconsistencies, which is you know why it's getting tougher and tougher for them to pull anything off now. Well, I mean that's the thing when it comes to because ultimately most of the arguments. That I'm sure you guys get the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the arguments that I receive, if you really boil it down, it comes down to something, some sort of information fed to us by NASA, some sort of imagery, some sort of video, whatever. And I guess because I am a graphic artist, I live in Photoshop, I live in you know Premiere and video software, After Effects and whatnot. I mean, that's what I do for a living. Yeah. I know how easy I can make, you know, give me enough time and I can make you believe almost anything. Oh, yeah. If I want to put it together. So I have a hard time really believing any of that stuff, especially since I know what can be done. But not just that. Uh, when I was in, I think I was still in high school, uh, I was dating this girl, and David Copperfield came to town. And, uh, you know, we both thought, hey, that'd be a pretty cool show to go see. So we walk into the venue, and um, this guy comes walking up to my girlfriend and says, you're perfect. And I said, excuse me, I'm thinking I'm going to be getting to What's the problem? What? What? what the heck are you? You know, uh, what are you talking about? You? And so, uh, you know, but he's like, no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean anything. Uh, but we're looking for, quote unquote, a volunteer to be on stage with David for one of his tricks. And, you know, they felt that she f fit the bill. 
And so, they're, and they're like, you know, as a perk, we'll give you guys, you know, third row seats, you know, right on the aisle. And, you know, you'll be, you know, all this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Pfft. and she's looking at me. I'm looking at her. I'm like, it's up to you. And she's like, yeah, I'd like to do it. I'm like, cool. So they take her away for a little while. They escort me to a third row seat right on the aisle. Pfft, perfect view of the stage. And uh, it was probably a half hour later, she came back and uh, I said, what did they do? She goes, I can't talk about it. I said, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, so, and I'm kind of looking at her weird and everything. The show gets going, and then David, you know, he's like, I need a volunteer, you know, and he's he's walking down from the stage, and he's pretending to be looking around, you know, and then he, he steps back and looks at her and says, you, and she goes up with him, and she, and she gets levitated on stage. He levitates her on stage, and I'm third row right practically underneath her looking at my girlfriend being levitated. He's doing the hoop around her and the whole deal, and I can't see how this is happening. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm like blown away by it. So when afterwards I'm asking her, how, what was it like? What did you feel? What was it like? You know, she couldn't tell me anything. She goes, you know, what? I honestly, I don't even remember going on stage. So clearly he did some kind of whammy on her and, and hypnotized her or whatever. Wow. But wow. she never told me and I, and I believe her, she didn't know. So they must've done something so she wouldn't know the trick. But the point is she was sitting next to me, no wires on her, you know, went, walked her on stage and levitated her. So, and I know it's an illusion but I can't for life of me figure out how they did it. You know, how David Copperfield did it. Yeah. Yeah. And which is why when I, uh, you know, I took a break from, from the clues after clue 11, but when I made clue 12, uh, which was called realize, I focused on the illusion part of it. And I said, look, I know people, everyone thinks it's like, no, no, I can't be fooled. You know, I can't be tricked by magician or street magic or anything like that. And I, I listed out, I broke down some examples. I said, no, you can, easily be fooled human beings are notoriously easy to fool uh you know both visually and audially um misdirection it is so especially visually though uh our perception abilities are are terrible to the point where you know i, I gave the the simulation thing uh, the example where if you're in a car in stop and go traffic you zone out for a second and then you don't know now how do i hear <laughs> if, if the what yeah, how do I get here if the car? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Is is the car in front of me moving forward, yeah. or am I moving backwards? Am I? <laughs> you're fumbling for the brakes. It's like, do I not have the brake on? <laughs> and they, they, you know, there's been university studies, and everybody falls into that. We are notoriously bad at that, um, to the point where we do not know. They literally said, you cannot tell if your car is moving. It's only assumed through everything else that's going around you. We're really, really bad at that. And I was going, do you really think that it would be hard to fool something when it comes to the sky where, when it, you know, and motion and, you know, where, where you think it's like, okay, because people always bring it up. It's like you're on a globe spinning at a thousand miles an hour. It's orbiting around the sun at 60,000 miles, but there's a moon spinning around that and you're going through space. That's a lot of motion. And you're not even genetically capable of determining if any of that's happening. At all, but you know, but people's and and but my argument is: Look, do you feel any motion? Do you feel any motion anywhere? And nobody does. Chris Angel, just watch Chris Angel. Chris Angel. I mean, that dude's yeah. freaky, man. <laughs> yeah, if people. If people can't figure out the magic tricks, like you were saying, Copperfield, Chris Angel, uh, any any of the others, if you can't figure out those, do you really think you figure out the big ones, the really big ones that that were meant to you know to totally fool you for years? No. Yeah. Well, we're going to be uh, getting fooled in 2025. That's when NASA says they're going to send humans to an asteroid. And then they have humans being sent to Mars in 2030. And that sounds far away, 2025, 2030, but really count it. You know, I mean, we're almost at 2016. It's not that far away. We hopefully will be alive to see what they do. And they're going to trick us. I wonder if they have some kind of a magician that they have a uh, a well, big name magician or some unknown big ma magician who kind of can help them with these illusions because they can make cruise liners disappear. I mean, you can't seems like they could pull this off, but you but maybe, but you can't. Unfortunately, if if the best Hollywood teams, you know, if you spend 500 million on a well, 200 million on a movie, uh, and they and the and the internet can still pick apart stuff scene by scene because most of the time because movies are shot out of order it's not shot you know like from the first page of the screenplay till the end they're always shooting in order so there's always inconsistencies i can't even imagine i wasn't kidding when i said look if somebody in the government if i was working at nasa and somebody handed me the fake mars folder I would I would look at him and go, are you insane? I don't care if you give me a billion dollars and, and the best talent in the business. I would be – there's no way it's going to be flawless. 
And and unfortunately, the, the the problem with the internet now, or I should say, the good thing for at least in the conspiracy side, is that everything sticks. Once it gets caught, it's replicated. Everyone gets on it, you know. And you got people in Nebraska at three in the morning looking at it, it's going, "Oh yeah, look at that frame. That's completely not right. What it should be. Here's why." And then they put it on Facebook, and boom, there it is. What? But most people aren't looking. The average person, when you go to the grocery store, has no idea and believes every single thing that they see that NASA yeah. puts out. That's the real problem. Well, but, you know, with, with more and more people saying, hey, check this out, look at this, look into this. And, you know, that's been the approach that I've been using. Uh, and it's worked on me. It's like, okay, you know, we say we're on a ball, right? 25,000 mile circumference. Okay, uh, how come Joshua Nowicki could see Chicago and take a picture of it from 60 miles away? Yeah. And, you know, this, these little questions. In, and I, and I, when I was on John B. Wells' show, um, I, I brought that up. And he said, well, you know, we don't know what the uh, – you're talking about AGL and uh, ASL in differences and saying, yeah. well, how do we know that, that that area from, you know, where Joshua Nowicki took it to where Chicago is isn't a raised flat area on the ball? Yep. Yep, you're right. And he did the same thing with you when you brought up Sean McCrary and shooting the, uh, the, the radar beam. I said, well, isn't it convenient for all the ballers out there that every single time a flat earther puts one of these up, you guys say it's a flat area on the ball? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, is that just a coincidence? I mean, really? Yeah, he, he was fighting it. And again, it's in his head. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. Again, everyone's got their own absorption period. And, you he know. It's cool, though. I, I have to say, uh, you know, I know that he's been very much against the whole thing. And even at the end of it, if you saw to the very end of the video as yeah. signing off, cause I was still online. He mouthed his, his words where it's round, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he did, I couldn't hear it, but I saw it in a video afterward, like you sneaky dog. But, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually meet him, uh, probably on Friday. He's in Dallas and they're having the JFK, uh, conspiracy. We're talking about conspiracies. JFK, after all these years, there's still, you know, new stuff coming out. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get into a, even more of a casual relationship with him, go out to lunch or dinner or whatever. You and should have a pizza. It's flat. Yeah. Just, was, you know. <laughs> hey, what do you think of this? <laughs> I, I still think, and again, if I ever get a chance to talk to him, I, I'm probably going to bring up at least one thing. It's like, look, out of all the conspiracies out there, why is this one? Yeah. The, yeah. Not only is it the most ridiculous, why is this one the only one we debunk to children? Why? We, we don't we don't bring up JFK to children at any age. We don't bring up nine eleven or anything like that. Well, we probably do now, but why do we? And he and he would come back and probably say, "Well, it's science. You know, the, the globe has to be in the classroom." I go, "Really? Does it? Or does it just, did we just put it there to make sure that no one would ask any questions?" Well, you know, that- uh, Jaronism. He, I, I haven't been able to talk to him yet. I, I'm I really got to get him on my show. I really want to talk to him sometime. So, Jaronism, if you're listening, I want to talk to you, buddy. Contact me. But um. <laughs> He he. Uh, the video he did on Horizons, yeah, uh, was fantastic, um, and and that's why I'm like, you know, I already did some things dealing with Horizons and stuff a while back, but he did some stuff with the camera zoom. You know, I don't know if he was using the Nikon uh, Coolpix 900 or whatever, but mm-hmm. there was a lot of good footage in there, and, and I thought he knocked that one out of the park. Yeah, yeah. There's only so you know the refraction thing is getting the argument is getting weaker and weaker. It's falling apart. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can especially again, and it's mostly because of the camera technology. the The zooming capability for HD cameras has gotten so good that now that's that's part of the big uh, the the big reason, in my opinion, why this thing's starting to break down is because there's footage out there now that wouldn't people wouldn't even look twice at. But now the cameras can show up really, really close, like a lighthouse. From you know when you're zooming, you pull all the way back and you see nothing, and then you keep zooming, you keep zooming. Oh, by the way, there's the bottom of a lighthouse. You know, at 30 miles, 40 miles away, should not be there. And people say, well, no, he's on a hill. It's like, no, he's on the beach. I've so, been trying to find, I've been trying to buy the Nikon Coolpix 900. Mm-hmm. Everybody's out of stock. Everywhere I've looked, it's out of stock. And, and nobody has a, a time when the stock's going to be filled. So all I can think of is, you know, I know Eric Dubay has one. He, um, he mentioned on one of the shows he was on saying mm-hmm. he had bought one. So it's got to be the flat earthers buying these things up. I think so. They're hard to find. Yeah. Amazon. It, uh, Amazon's out of stock? Well, they've had them on there. It probably comes and goes, but you can buy them on Amazon. Yeah, I think I think recently they've been getting bought up, but um, we got like four minutes left. So, uh, Patricia, uh, tell everybody about your a little bit more about your YouTube uh, channel, and if you've got some, if you would recommend one video, like the, to the hardcore skeptic, uh, which interview would you point to? 
It's what I mentioned at the very beginning of your show, which is uh, Brian Mullen, and um, it is episode number 15 of Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, and Brian Mullen is a structural engineer, and he talks about the math behind why the globe doesn't exist. So check that out, and it's Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, and that is on YouTube. As a structural engineer, did he talk about surveying and, and things of that and, and, and you know, does anybody ever build for a curve in mind? I mean, I've heard the answer to that is absolutely not. No one ever does. Even huge projects like casinos, no, they don't. Hmm. Uh, Mark, who yeah. who would you say, you know, what would be the one video if, if somebody, if you were to, well, everybody knows your videos, obviously. Yeah, yeah, well, no, no. If I was going to do like a, like give everybody, because, you know, the Flat Earth Clue is fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone, there, people are going to run into those anyway. Yeah. But if I had a point of day thing, in fact, I made a, a brand new playlist on my YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is called uh, Mark K. Sargent. Of course, if you look up Flat Earth Clues on YouTube, you're going to find me eventually. But I made a playlist called Testimony Shows. And all that's in there are the people that have come forward to talk about the, you know, to confirm the flat model. Uh, the first one on the, very, on the list is the U.S. Navy missile instructor. That's Sean McCrary. Um, there's also the submarine uh, chief, the United States Army radar operator, the industrial valve expert, the flight instructor, uh, and, and the, even the people that, that didn't mention anything you know, or the, the, I didn't get to read stuff like the, the United States Marine Corps sniper instructor. There's no – basically they're all saying the same thing. None of them are contradicting anybody else. And they're all saying, look, there's no curvature to the earth. There's no Coriolis effect. And the navigation is completely wrong. The maps are wrong. Uh, find find me someone else from the professional sector or the military that's going to come forward and try to challenge these guys. They're not, which is why the debunkers are just having fits right now. You know, I have to say one of the things, you know, there was two things that was, that was holding me back from embracing the whole flat earth thing. And that was the uh, Coriolis effect and the lunar eclipses. But those are no longer on my radar anymore. I, I've, I've pretty much resolved those, at least in my mind. I'm, I'm not too concerned with them. But I have to say, there's, and I wish I had more than a minute and a half left to address this. <laughs> um, but maybe we'll deal with it on another show. I have to have you guys back or something. Okay. But it's the issue of the flights that allegedly go, and people are saying, people are getting on these flights, 11-hour, 12-hour flights from Chile to Australia going under the ball. And it just doesn't work on the flat Earth map. And that one's driving me crazy. Unless the scale, I know we don't have a lot of time, unless the scale is wrong. We know what the flat Earth map kind of looks like in terms of continent layout, but we don't know the miles per inch, whatever the scale is. So my argument is always the same. It's like, fine, you, got, you went from Santiago to Chile to uh, Auckland. Fine. Uh, you got point A to point B. How'd you get there? Because you dropped off the GPS system and you can't tell me the route you took. So until you can tell me the route you took, then that, that point's a stalemate. Well, but the, the hang-up I have on it is they, they point to they, – they could look out the window and see the Antarctic coastline for a period of time, which makes sense on the ball. On the outer rim of the circle, it doesn't really make sense that that would be the route you would want to take, and yet people are seeing – the, you know, they're flying right over the coastline, but pff, man, we're like totally out of time. Nah. I'm going to have to have you guys back on again. Let's do another round table sometime. Maybe get some other people on, um, you know, on each other's shows and do what Patricia said. Hey, let's all, you know, get together and talk about this stuff. But thank you guys so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Absolutely. And thank you guys so much for listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. We'll see you back here next Wednesday night, uh, 11 p.m. Central Standard Time to 1 a.m. Check out Mark Sardis' videos and check out Patricia Steer's videos. Good night, everybody.